The sandstone, which this fabulous building was made from, was actually part of another environment, the banks of the Bow River. The abundance of sandstone, its durability and resistance to fire, made it a suitable building material. When a city ordinance restricted the use of wood in an effort to prevent fires, Calgary soon became known as Sandstone City. This ordinance contributed in part to the success of the sandstone quarries on the banks of the Bow River, and it was there that human disturbance initiated a series of untimely successional events in the natural community. At the end of this program, you'll understand successional events and their natural and human causes. You'll also see how a study on succession is performed in a microenvironment. Different populations of organisms change over long and short periods of time. This process is called succession. A variety of plants, animals, fungi, and so on make up communities. They inhabit a particular area and they have the potential to interact. By examining and studying communities, we can observe the patterns of change or succession. The distribution and abundance of all living things result from past and present interactions with their environments. Communities may range from those on the ground to those higher in the forest canopy, and from those in the soil to those in water. Large-scale ecosystems, like this prairie grassland biome, appear to be similar over vast areas, but the actual species composition varies from location to location. Biomes consist of many communities and are characterized by a predominant vegetation and climate. By studying microenvironments within biomes and communities, our understanding of ecological relationships can be applied to larger ecosystems. The site chosen for this study was inhabited by early settlers in the 1880s. The early settlers used four quarries in the area to build sandstone buildings as a new prairie city took shape. Apart from the quarries, which are now overgrown, much of the area is still in its natural state. Today it is a protected park containing three biomes, prairie grassland, aspen parkland, and riverine forest. In this latter biome, some of the Douglas fir trees predate the arrival of the first European to see the Canadian Rockies. This community of Douglas firs is the only one of its kind in this region. This region, the montane, is characterized by the dryness caused by Chinook winds and the rain shadows of the mountains. Montane communities include plants which grow well in other parts of Canada, but are rare in Alberta. The focus of this study centers around these objectives. To observe succession within an ecosystem, to record and describe the abiotic and biotic factors involved, and to create a model of succession in the study area. A quadrat, measuring one meter square, is used to study representative flora and fauna in a given ecosystem. Plant and insect species are identified and counted within each quadrat to give an extrapolated population abundance. The quadrat is too confining for the proper operation of a sweep net to collect representative invertebrates. The sweep net is therefore used just outside the quadrat for the purpose of collecting and identifying the fauna in that area. Quadrats can be set up in different locations to measure the successional changes that have occurred within the study area. By making observations in a simple quadrat, we can appreciate some of the biodiversity in populations and communities. Regardless of the simplicity or complexity of living things, all things play an important role in maintaining life on this planet. Let's see if we can figure out some of the dynamics. Is everyone ready? Sure. Let's establish our transects and get going. Okay, remember, we need to look at the different abiotic or non-living factors. We also need to note the abundance and distribution of the biotic or living factors. A light meter is used to determine the light intensity at a selected location. The sensor is held at various heights, and a range is selected on the control panel to coincide with the amount of light. 
the range is recorded as well as the numerical reading of the needle deflection. These readings will be combined to give a final reading in watts per square meter after using a conversion factor. Okay, light intensity at ground level is uh, 40 watts per square meter. Uh, did you get that? Ground, it's 40 watts uh -huh. per square meter. Okay, how about at 30 centimeters? At 30 centimeters, it's uh, 60 watts per square meter. 60 watts per square meter. Perfect. The amount of heat energy affects the distribution of organisms. Thermometers are used to measure soil and air temperature. Don't forget to take the soil temperature to the nearest degree. How deep should I put this in? Five centimeters should give us the ambient soil temperature. At 30 centimeters above the ground, the temperature is 18 degrees Celsius. Precipitation is measured using a rain gauge. Samples of rainfall are collected over a period of time within a designated area to produce an average rainfall reading and precipitation profile. What reading did you get, Andrea? Uh, four mils. So in the past 10 days, they've had two millimeters of rain here. Good. We should be able to compare that with the average annual rainfall. Yeah. This probe will give us the moisture content of the soil in centibars. And if we follow the transect, we should have a good idea of the soil moisture. Soil condition is very important in determining what is going to live here. It's important we took the sample from below the surface, where the roots are. Okay, I'm getting a pH reading of 7.2. It's a little basic. Wind increases the rates of heat and water loss in organisms. Wind may also affect the morphology or shape of plants. Using an anemometer, we can measure the velocity of the wind in knots or kilometers per hour. The cups of the anemometer catch the wind, and the rotation that results is converted into a wind speed reading. Populations of different species make up communities. The trophic structure in a community consists of different feeding levels among the organisms. This structure is determined by biotic interactions, the past history of the community, and its current stage of succession. Natural or human disturbances and chance events can contribute to changes. How and when the community reaches equilibrium depends on its location and time. I think we've collected all the data we need. If ecology is the study of living things and how they get along with their environment, then how come we're collecting all this data on light and temperature? Well, living things are affected by, and in turn affect, the abiotic and biotic factors found in their environments. You mean that the non-living things affect the living things? Yeah, that's right. And living things affect non-living things. How do living things affect non-living things? Think about the elements that were incorporated within these quadrats. Uh, the shrub, for example. Well, the taller plant is blocking the light from the smaller plants, so the temperature is affected. Yeah, actually, in our research, we found that temperature tends to be about four degrees cooler in the shade. So, from your research, what affects the distribution and abundance of living things? Abiotic and biotic conditions vary. As they change, so do the types of organisms. Not only the types, but their numbers. What about at a different time? Do you think it was always like this around here? Probably not. Everything changes over time. As natural and human activities alter abiotic conditions, ecosystems are affected. The absence or presence of a species depends on its ability to disperse and tolerate local abiotic and biotic factors. Abiotic factors exert selection pressure on different populations, and this results in differences within the biotic factors. All of these factors are largely dependent upon time. Just one more set of numbers to crunch. And voila! Now we can start building our model. I'll need a hard copy of the data to compare it with our field notes. Yeah, it's probably a good idea to double check. Uh -huh. What about errors in our data? The data is probably as accurate as your instruments and your measuring techniques would allow. But what are some things you couldn't account for? We probably couldn't see everything that was going on. Right. We only recorded a limited amount of data. There are too many variables to look at given how complex communities are. A transition in the species composition of a community is known as succession. 
If no previous organisms were present, the process is known as primary succession. In primary succession, early successional stages are dominated by colonizing plants, otherwise known as pioneer species. These organisms disperse readily and grow rapidly. They are able to tolerate the specific abiotic conditions at that time. Secondary succession occurs when an existing community has been disrupted by fire, logging, farming or quarrying. As more extensive and complex community interactions occur, biodiversity generally increases. After a number of transitional stages, the community stabilizes. Addition of new niches or species is difficult. This stage is classically referred to as the climax community. Some ecologists now believe that communities mature but never reach climax stage. Instead, they continue to change. Well, succession is one of the oldest ideas in ecology. Uh, it's been around now for almost 100 years. Um, needless to say, during this time, it's undergone con considerable change. Uh, if you simply think 100 years ago, ecologists as ecology was just starting, uh, there were lots of things they didn't know. For example, there was no meteorology or climatology as we know it. There was no soil science. Uh, biology uh, was nothing like it was today. No genetics. The physiology that we all take for granted uh, today didn't exist. And so all of this must have meant that the idea of succession was very different uh, because of the background knowledge. Uh, but particularly in the last 20 or 30 years, there's been some major changes. In, in the ideas of succession. The first is that in the last 20 years we've discovered that unlike what early people thought in succession, which was that there would be a disturbance, then there would be a long period of, of kind of quiet while the vegetation recovered, often hundreds, maybe thousands of years of, of, of relatively stable conditions. We now know that that's not true. The disturbance uh, is, is the rule and then if, if succession in succession if it didn't happen the the plants and animals would uh, be disturbed by the fact that there was no disturbance that they are all adjusted in various ways a good example of that is in the eastern deciduous forest where wind is a particularly prominent role it can cause individual branches to break off during ice storms or so individual trees blow down in small uh, gusts of storms or very large areas uh, of trees blown down for of, of, of tens of hundreds of, of hectares. The second major change in, in, in succession is probably kind of even more surprising and that is that classically succession was studied by a, uh, an approach called chrono sequences which is kind of misleading chrono sequence meaning time sequences. In fact what it is is a spatial sequence which was supposed to to mimic a, a, a time sequence. As with most things there are assumptions involved in these and, and the assumptions that engaged in the, in the chrono sequence at first when ecology was first developing the idea of succession it sounded pretty reasonable. Uh, the trouble is that now we know that many of these things are not true. What we find is that after a disturbance is that mostly both of the trees, lodgepole pine and Engelmann spruce, both come in at the same time. Uh, sometimes Engelmann spruce a little more abundant, sometimes lodgepole pine a little more abundant due to an assortment of things. One is dispersal of seeds in uh, from near surviving trees, uh, from the original density of the trees that were there before the fire from uh, how much of the duff material on the forest floor has been burnt away so that different amounts of, of seedlings can get started, all of which are quite highly variable. One of the significant tools that have been used uh, in uh, studies of succession is to take all the ideas that you have about individual species and how they, they're, how they grow and how they compete with each other and how they interact with different kinds of climates, put that information into a computer program and then to essentially put in climate and particular sites and to see what would happen. And the, the simulation we have here is for an area in western uh, Ontario in the boreal forest and uh, it, the program essentially mimics all of these things and puts them all together and in this sort of graphic presentation that we have here um, we can see the, the trees grow up 
and trees that disappear are trees that are dying, and trees that appear are trees that are recruiting in. Uh, the interesting thing, if we had time, was be to run this again, and uh, and seeing the end result here of, of 150 years or so of of the simulation. If we ran it again for 150 years, we wouldn't get the same composition. We could get quite a different composition. There'd be certain similarities. Uh, the white birch, the big white uh, trees here, would still be present because they're still uh, rapidly growing in a in an open area. But the other um, trees would be slightly different. So each time we ran it, it would be slightly different. Why? Because each time the starting conditions and the conditions after the disturbance would be a little different. The kinds of trees that would appear would be quite somewhat different. Who sat down next to each other, what species would be slightly different, so they would compete slightly different, all of which would lead to slightly different outcomes. Um, even though we have a fairly good understanding of how they compete and, and other life history characteristics of them, it's still somewhat difficult to predict exactly what the mix would be. Who would have thought that a sandstone quarry once existed right where we were collecting our data? Yeah, our model should illustrate the, the transitional stages from the point the quarry stopped production to the present stage of development. Mm -hmm. We we'll use these levels to represent different stages in the successional process. Okay, so this axis can represent the change in time, and these steps will show the difference of species abundance. You can put the colonizers here, the first pioneer species. Right, followed by the broadleaf species and the insects. And as an area matures, larger plants and shrubs and even birds come along. And finally, present day. But it's not quite that simple. No, uh, with time, everything changes. All right, you two, what have you come up with? Well, here you can see the different changes that occurred as time went by. We put colonizers, like these grass plants, at every stage of our model. And at the last stage, representing the present, we have some aspen and some poplar. These trees take longer to grow and would be found at later stages. All right, I see why these organisms are placed here. But why have you included these colonizers at every stage in your model? When we did the sampling at the quadrat, we found colonizers at every stage. Actually, we counted 225 grass plants. If there are that many at this later stage of community development, we guess that there must have been the same or possibly even more earlier in time. If the major disturbance in the area occurred before 1915, then that gives the pioneer species about 80 years to come and go. Finding the pioneer species supports the idea that change is still happening. Yeah, that's right. Communities of living things are constantly changing. Different types and numbers of species occur at each different successional stage. Would that mean that disturbances are also occurring? Well, it could be. Scientists who study clearings and forests formed by falling trees have discovered that immigration of new species and extinctions of old species occurs very rapidly. So that means that different species from different successional stages can coexist, like what you've got in your model. Let's have a look at the photos you've taken. It looks like disturbances allow different plants to start to grow. So, if that's the case, then if the environment on the other side of the river is different, then we should find different species population distribution. Or you could also infer that different successional stages have occurred. But you're going to need to go and check that out. Communities are also in continual non-equilibrium. This means that species and communities can change. Dispersal of organisms and disturbance play major roles in shaping communities. Species are replaced by others that are better adapted to the new environmental conditions. The greatest diversity is found when organisms from different successional stages are present. Biodiversity is reduced, however, when disturbances are so great that organisms can no longer tolerate the abiotic factors. As habitat changes, new niches can be realized. Disturbances, however destructive to whole communities, or just to parts of them, play an important role in succession. This 80 hectare blowdown will maintain diversity by going through different successional stages. Studies of disturbed areas show that the species found there have come to depend on frequent changes in order to initiate and complete their life cycles. Okay, did you get that third light reading? I'm getting a reading of 400 watts per square meter. That gives us an average of 420 for this quadrat. Do you remember the soil moisture reading? It was 25.5 centibars. 
And the soil temperature? 16.8 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's about it. Let's go back to the lab and enter the results into the computer. It looks like the abiotic factors really affect the biotic composition. Yeah, so in other words, the distribution and number of species at each location depends on their interactions with the abiotic conditions found there. Now, what are some of the other factors that influence succession? You mean there's more? Regardless of the successional stage and its stability or diversity, a community can be disturbed by natural events such as periodic flooding, wind, or fires from lightning. Human activities can also disturb communities. Pristine wildlands are diminishing under the burden of supplying a consuming populace. In light of current ecological understanding, alternate techniques have been developed. These techniques involve selective tree felling and other sustainable logging practices. Fire is a dramatic agent of change. This one was set deliberately, not as an act of destruction, but as a tool to allow different plants, the pioneer species, to initiate succession. The two considerations for, for planting a prescribed burn would be uh, safety to the public and uh, putting in the right kind of fire in the right kind of place. So here, uh, in this forest, we want to have quite a bit of canopy kill, uh, so it has to be fairly intense, uh, relatively low consumption of the forest floor, uh, so it's not too severe and it doesn't <clears throat> take all the uh, organic material off the site. Uh, and it has to be safely carried out. It has to be a fire that we can contain or fight uh, if need be, if conditions change after we've lit it. In this area, uh, vegetation grows slowly and it decomposes even slower. So you see a lot of down wood remains on the forest floor and over time, uh, vegetation, both standing and dead, locks up nutrients. A fire comes through and releases those nutrients. That plus the uh, sunlight that, that enters uh, the forest stimulates uh, the kind of lush growth that we see now. These uh, shrubs will be much smaller and less numerous in the unborn, unburned forest. And uh, there's a different kind of species mix. But this is a kind of species mix that's very productive for wildlife. This is an area that hasn't burned for over 100 years. So what differences do you see here, Andrea? The the ground cover is different. Over in the site where we were before, there's there's a lot more grasses and shrubs and stuff like that. And here, we seem to have like more more mosses and and bigger trees, I guess. Right. The trees are not only bigger, but a different kind of uh, species composition. This uh, short needled tree is spruce, and it's beginning to dominate the stand. This area looks a lot different. It's almost tidy. What happened here? Well, this area is tidy because of frequent fires in the past that have burned up the downed wood and debris that we were in in the last burn. That was part of the reason it was chosen, was that there's an area here of naturally light fuels that is pinched off in part by the mountain ridge above us the road below us. So it meant that there was only a small area which we had to be concerned about keeping the fire from spreading through. Wow, this looks like it was a pretty intense fire. Yes, uh, in some areas the pattern uh, is for these intense stand replacing fires on a patch that is fairly large, perhaps uh, you know, 100 or 200 hectares will be completely killed. 
And that is a pattern that we're trying to, uh, to match as well. The lodgepole pine forest here requires three conditions to, uh, to regenerate. One is that the trees be killed to release the uh, seed in the cones. The second is that there be bare mineral soil exposed. And the third is that uh, sunlight be able to uh, penetrate the canopy and provide the light that the trees need. So how long did this all take to grow back? How could we figure that out? We could set up a quadrat and gather some data on species diversity. And what would that tell us, Blair? The different species and their abundance will tell you how quickly things change. Do you think that deliberately burning an area to induce succession and to increase biodiversity is a good practice? Yeah, like what they do in national parks. What do you think about that, Andrea? A good practice requires scientific research, doesn't it? That's correct, but even yet, things aren't absolute. Yeah, but succession is initiated by disturbances, like when space is created due to forest logging or burning. I think that does cause changes, but are these changes supposed to happen? Let's see if we can figure that out. Look over there and tell me what you see. Well, it's a lot different over there than it is over here. And you can see where the fire was extinguished. It stopped about there. What about the types and abundance of plants? Well, over there, there's a lot of grasses, and over here, we have fireweed and different grasses. Yeah, and it seems like other weeds, like, uh, like those nettles, have taken the place of what was originally here. That's good. And that's known as recruitment. When an area is disturbed, these weeds are the first colonizers that come back to this area. But who's to say that an area is supposed to begin changing at the precise moment it's burned? Good point. We humans need to clearly think about how we intrude on the ecosystem and disrupt its continuity and cycles. Human disturbances drastically affect community succession. Logging and clearing for farming have reduced and disconnected forests. Agricultural development has disrupted grasslands. With frequent disruptions, early stages of succession, characterized by weedy and shrubby growth, lasts for many years. Large-scale, long-term disturbances have contributed to famine as grasslands have been turned into deserts. Ecologists are struggling to fully understand the complex relationships between biodiversity and community stability. Let's go over what we learned about life on the slopes, succession and different communities. Well, ecological succession means that communities change. The composition of species will be different as time passes. When this change begins in an uninhabited area, it is called primary succession. If existing communities are destroyed by some sort of disturbance, then secondary succession takes over. Abiotic and biotic factors determine the course of succession. As a community matures, a climax stage is reached and then change is slower. Change, disturbances and diversity are very much interconnected, just like the interrelationships between and within the populations that make up communities.